So today I'm taking another look at the Jet KVM. For those of you who didn't see my first video, this little tiny guy here with the little screen is the Jet KVM. It's a remote keyboard video mouse solution. So you plug this guy in with his HDMI cable and his USB cable into your victim computer. Then you can completely control this computer remotely as if you were there with a keyboard mouse and you can see the monitor on your computer. So anyway, I, uh, I reviewed this thing relatively favorably. I got a link up here to the original video if you want to see that. And I'm not here to talk about how it works today. I'm here to do a follow-up on security. So I recently took a look at the cheaper Nano KVM by Cyped. This stirred a very long video on all the security issues of this product. And so some of you guys asked if I could go back and take another look at the Jet KVM to see if it had any of those same security issues. So I'm going to try to look at all of the different security issues that the Nano KVM had and some other similar issues and see if any of them also apply to the Jet KVM. So how is its data security in general? Now obviously the Jet KVM is a remote access device. So by putting this on your computer, you're giving anyone who has control of the Jet KVM essentially full remote control of whatever computer it's connected to. So that could be potentially a very dangerous thing if you're not careful with who has access to your Jet KVM. And that's why security for a device like this is so important. I mean, security should be important for every device we put on the network, period. But this is a device for remote access that's a particularly security sensitive topic. So anyway, come along in this adventure. Couple disclosures today. First off, Jet KVM sent me this unit for review in the past. Review video is already put up there somewhere. Uh, no money changed hands. They did see the review video already because I released it in the past, but they again won't see this video until you guys do. I've also contributed not to any of their code, but I've submitted issues as I was testing the device originally and since then, and they've been very responsive to me in their GitHub, and most of the issues I've reported have either already been addressed or are being addressed. Also, this is not a brand new unit, so with the Nano KVM, I was able to take it out of the box and test it directly. I've already thoroughly tested this guy, so before I test it today, I'm going to do a full firmware update, then I'm going to try to reset it to factory default, and go from there. And I hope that's reset enough that it gets a close to out of the box experience, but that's the best I can do. So this is the same test setup I had from the SIP Nano KVM video. We've got a uh, Microtech Hex S that's doing my packet capture. It's also acting as a router on this little subnet, DNS, that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna give this guy maybe 20 seconds to boot up, do any initial stuff I might do. Then I'll log into it and hopefully we can differentiate those two times in the packet capture. So I'm logged in here to the KVM. This is again not using HTTPS. This is only using HTTP. By default, SSH is disabled, so I could prove that. But you have to come down here and enter your public key to enable SSH. And they only allow SSH key auth. They don't allow usernames and passwords. So I've connected HTMI just so we can kind of look at what's going on here. I'm going to log into this machine. So I just typed a bit of text out here. I'm going to see if I can recover that text because this is insecure, although I don't believe it's using HTTP for the actual transport of this stuff. So I've got the packet capture, the basic stuff going on here. I haven't set up their cloud environment. Um, you can enroll in it once you've configured the device initially. I didn't do that, so I shouldn't see anything reaching out to the cloud. I expect to see basic stuff like NTP, um, maybe checking some gateway to see if the internet connection's up, maybe checking for updates because I loaded the UI. Uh, some elements of the UI do check for updates, so we'll see how that goes. So it looks like it started right off with a duplicate address discovery for IPv6. So that probably means it's actually doing IPv6. I'll get back to that in a second. So here it did a DHCP discover offer request X, so it got an IP address and it got 250. So here it reaches out for DNS for Cloudflare. It's actually looking for 127.0.0.1, which is an interesting thing to see on the wire, and I'm guessing that's a bug. So next up, we're looking for stuff over MDNS, over IPv4 and IPv6. We're looking for a number of .locals. Uh, we're looking for quad A's in all these cases, I think. None of those come back. Next up, we have a stun binding request. And this actually goes out to my network, so I think this is my laptop. I guess maybe I should have, like, closed the web browser on my laptop. I still have the page open from when this was rebooted before. So I believe it's trying to stun its way to my laptop, which has an IP address on a different subnet. So I'm looking at this thing from my normal subnet, not my restricted subnet. And I guess it's trying to do that connection with stun locally. And yeah, so 1581 is my laptop. And then here it says binding success 1554. That's actually the router of my, um, 
Microtik router. So next it queried itself on the wire for API to JKVD com, and this is going to be the update checker. And then you see here it successfully did application data using DTLS 1.2. So this would be WebRTC that figured itself out via stun. So even though the web page itself is loaded insecurely over HTTP, the actual data traffic on this thing is using WebRTC, and that is secured with a self-signed certificate. So you don't get the same security as having publicly signed certificates, but I don't think we expect a device like this to actually come with a real cert. We expect you to have to install that if you're gonna use a real cert. So a self-signed cert is a very normal thing for this to do, and I'm glad they're using security. So next up, it does a DNS request to the router for time.cloudflare.com. So it's trying to sync time, I'm gonna guess, NTP, and it's correctly asking my network um, DNS server. And then again, it reaches out to time.cloudflare.com to sync NTP, very normal. So all the way down here at 29 seconds is when it starts reaching out to api.jetkvm.com. So this is after I have opened the web browser. So now it's checking for an update to fulfill the web browser request. And then it does that over TLS 1.3 as well. So the only reaching out to the internet it did before I opened my web browser was connecting to time.cloudflare.com over NTP. So that's to sync network time. I think we kind of expected that. Once I connected my web browser, then it reached out to api.jackkvm.com, which I believe is the update checker. Um, in any case, it got back that there was no update needed. It was a relatively short conversation. Editing AppLart here for a little bit of an interjection. When I did this IP down KVM, I noticed it was reaching out to stun and turn uh, servers from Google and Cloudflare. I thought that was part of TailScale, but someone else pointed me to that it's actually part of SIPED's WebRTC implementation. So stun is a protocol used to match make between two different peers, even if they're behind NAT. So it's used for NAT traversal. Um, TailScale uses it internally, obviously, which is why I thought they were reaching out. They were the ones doing it. But WebRTC also makes heavy use of stun. And so here on the Jet KVM, it's doing stun discovery, but it's only doing it locally. So you can see my subnet here was 192 to 168 at 88. That's the subnet that the Jet KVM is on. And it stunned its way to 172.27.15, which is one level up in the NAT. So it punched through one level of NAT to find my laptop, and it never went out to the internet to do this. So through all of these traffic logs, it never connected to a public stun server. It never went out to Google or Cloudflare or anyone. It was able to use its HTTP connection um, to figure out the IP addresses on my laptop and then get there via stun. So the uh, SIP Nano KVM was not able to do this, they were relying on public stun servers, Google and Cloudflare, to do their uh, WebRTC matchmaking. Whereas this library that JetKVM is using, if you're on a purely local connection, does not reach out to the internet for stun and turn. I'm also capturing in real time now on my Mac so I can look at that HTTP traffic. So if I hit refresh here, it should reload everything on the page. And I should be able to see what's going on in uh, Wireshark. So we got just a ton of traffic now, so I'll stop the log. So dot 250 is the KVM and dot 2 is my laptop. But after all this TCP, then we switch over to DTLS and we do everything over DTLS. So this is the um, Datagram TLS. This will be the actual WebRTC traffic. So I'm going to set a password here. Let's see where that goes. So now we need to log in. And let's log in. No F off Safari. So did our password end up in this? And there, in fact, is the password. I would like to point out here that sending the password to the server like this is not unusual in cases where the transport layer is secure. So my last video, I mentioned a bit about hashing on the client side, and that would be the best advice in cases where the transport is insecure. So the transport's insecure, we have to do hashing and encryption on both sides to do a secure handshake. However, if we're using TLS, we already rely on TLS to provide that secure handshake, and we need to do password hashing on the server side. So this is a correct design choice, except for the fact that we don't have that transport security, TLS. So TLS probably needs to come into play. So now TLS support is on their roadmap, and they are allegedly working on it. So based on their progress on their GitHub, I can't trust them on that. In case you guys are curious, on the server side, they use the algorithm bcrypt to encrypt passwords. So you can see here, they're doing some bcrypt operation. They're using a library written in Go that does bcrypt password cryptography. 
So here's their password changing code, and again, it's using bcrypt. So bcrypt, for those of you who don't know, is a password hashing function based on Blowfish that is uh, quite good. It's used by OpenBSD, it's used by Linux, things like that. So it's a very reasonable choice here. I'd also like to point out that um, this does not happen over the cloud connection. So let's take a look at what the cloud connection looks like. So I'm going to now enroll my guy in the cloud. So now I'm connected through the cloud here. So I'm working remotely. What does this data look like on the wire? So this is what the traffic looks like going through the router. And you can see it found a shortcut path because we're on the same network. So it found a shortcut through my router to my LAN network where it um, doesn't even have to go through the cloud. It's just connecting directly. This is all UDP and it's not able to decrypt any of it. It just says data. So Wireshark is not helping me here. So it recognizes this as DTLS, but it's not able to decode anything meaningful from it. It looks like this is it reaching out to their control server. And again, this is all using TLS 1.2. So this seems to be quite happy. Looks like we caught a reconnection here. So it's doing a client certificate key exchange, server key exchange. Let's see, do we have anything here we can look at? Server hello. So looks like their certificate uh, just says common name is WebRTC. And it's a ECDSA with SHA-256 key, which is very normal. So they claim their cloud service is end-to-end -end encrypted, and it sure seems like that's true. When we're running through the cloud service, all of the traffic goes through WebRTC, which is encrypted using DTLS, Datagram TLS. And it's using self-signed certs on both sides, which is a normal thing for a device like this not to have a publicly signed cert. And it's about as secure as using HTTPS, again, with a publicly signed cert. Um, because they're using WebRTC for this, it actually managed to find a connection through my network on its own without having to go through a relay server in the cloud. Now, it could have also done that using TailScale. That would have been a much heavier weight solution than doing WebRTC like they did here. So I think this was a reasonable choice. I still like to see HTTPS on the web UI, but actually, if you just log in through the cloud service, even locally, you'll get a direct connection locally on the same network because they'll figure out they're on the same network and talk to each other. And you'll get all of the encryption that you would have gotten from the cloud service. So it's actually more secure to go through the cloud service, even on a local network which I think is interesting. So the only problem I see that still hasn't been fixed is there's no IPv6 support still. It actually gets an IPv6 address and drop bar SSH works over SSH. But for some reason, their app isn't binding correctly. And we actually took a little bit of a look at it with one of the developers and it should be binding correctly. They're telling it to bind correctly. So we're not entirely sure what's going on there, but they're looking at it. So I'll let them do that and get on with it. In any case, this was a much shorter video than the SIP Nano KVM because I don't have to do any binary reverse engineering here. This is running a pretty basic Rockchip CPU. They're starting with a Rockchip build root Linux image and they're only adding like two binaries to it, KVM native and JetKVM KVM. So it's pretty much it. It's a pretty simple setup they've got going on. They're relying on Rockchip's hardware libraries that come with Rockchip's Linux distribution. So nothing is going out of band there. They're not running their own download server or anything like that. Um, so I don't see a lot of the same problems you saw with Cypede. So anyway, thanks for coming along on this adventure. Hopefully you guys like the Jet KVM. I like the Jet KVM. I like working with the guys too. They've been very responsive to issues I've brought up. Um, the community in general, they have a Discord server where they talk about enhancements and things like that. So this of course is a Kickstarter. So all their backers are starting to get their backing shipped some of them have gotten them by now, some of them haven't, but that's just how Kickstarters go. Um, if you want to chat with me personally, I have a Discord server link down below for that. Uh, what else? I have a Ko-fi. It's kind of like Patreon, but it's only a one-time thing, not recurring. If you want to give me a tip, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, and as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.